Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Evangelical Lutheran Church and our worship service for this, the fifth Sunday in Lent. And, and once again, the emphasis in Lent on Wednesdays is on repentance. On Sundays, more on the attitude of God in forgiving us all our sins. And you're going to see that as a magnificent focus throughout the lessons for today. So pay very careful attention to what God has to say there. Now, up on the monitors, you have the worship service. Also in this worship folder in its entirety, you can set aside these two inserts. This is informational for all the ladies in the congregation. Look at that after the service is over. This is one of the hymns we'll be singing during the distribution of the Lord's Supper, so you can set that aside for now as well. You won't need it during the body of our worship service today. Now we have uh, two intercessions before us this morning. Uh, Bobby and Sherry Johnson's daughter-in-law's father is near death. He's been taken off of oxygen. He's on morphine. Uh, from what I've been told, uh, he is not in Christ as of this moment in his life. Uh, the daughter is by his side, but he doesn't want any other visitors. Um, we're going to offer an intercession, uh, kind of hoping for the thief's prayer before this man goes out of this life into whatever life awaits him. So let's keep that in mind. That's, that's a hard prayer to offer, but God can do all things. And then uh, Joanne Grothal's surgery was, we shall say, fairly successful. Okay, the surgery, the procedure went smoothly, but some of the congestion is recurring. And we're hoping that that's just a tiny little bit of aftermath and that it will go away completely. That's our prayer for her. Any other requests for special intercessions in this morning's worship? God is good. Take a moment for your own private preparation to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our opening hymn, 580, Every Morning, Mercy's New. Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy Christian church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O oh Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Almighty God, merciful Father, you crown our life with your love. You take away our sin. You comfort our spirit. You make us pure and holy in your sight. You did not spare your only son, but gave him up for us all. O oh Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the Son of God, eternal word of the Father, you came to live with us, you made your Father known, you washed us from our sins in your own blood, you are the King of glory, you are the Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Prayer for today at the top of page three in the worship folder, also up on the monitor. Please join me in this prayer. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, the depth of your love for us is unfathomable. You did not love your life more than you valued our redemption. Our personal devotion to you is not nearly as admirable. It is hard for us to see beyond the time and pleasure of this world to heaven, the resurrection, and eternity. Forgive us for holding so tightly to things that shall pass away so soon. Loosen our hold on temporary blessings and free us to embrace you and your teachings. In the knowledge and reliance on forgiveness full and free, instill in us true humility. In the light of your service to us, create a new level of obedience in us to you. For you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please, sit down.
There are a lot of things that can be said about this text, and I'm going to say a lot of them right now. First of all, whenever you see the, the word Lord in all caps in this text, in the original Hebrew, the name for God, the name he gave himself, is given. Jehovah, I am. So keep in mind that he is thereby identifying himself as the only God there is, and the God who is making this promise to everyone who lives. Take note that he describes the deliverance from Egypt as something he accomplished, and we know the history of that. The ten plagues that came upon that nation and devastated its residents while Israel was protected from all of those plagues. Still to this day, that's considered a type of the deliverance from the slavery of sin and death and the power of the devil that God affords to each and every human being. In simplest terms, and you're going to hear it here, there was a covenant made through Moses on Mount Sinai. You know about that, the Ten Commandments, the centerpiece of the civil ceremonial and moral codes was given to them by God through Moses, but it was law, and it demanded perfection. It was an if-then relationship. If you obey, then I will bless you with prosperity and conquest and an enduring status among all the nations of the Canaan area. If you do not, then I will curse you, and you will lose your status with me, and I will see to your ultimate destruction, invasion by a foreign power, and exile into a foreign country. The covenant of the law was a difficult one for them to maintain on their side of the bargain. But God understood that this nation's preservation was first and foremost for the sake of preserving the promise of the gospel. And when you hear that promise stated in so many words in boldface at the end of this particular segment, revel and rejoice in this fact, that its promise made and preserved is a promise kept always and only by God's doing it, by God's grace. So now, pay careful attention. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The time is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That last sentence is so significant that it's worthwhile committing it to your memory. And maybe recalling it every evening before you drift off to sleep. That God has made a promise to you and it's not based on anything you do for him. But everything he has done for us in Jesus Christ. He promises. I will forgive your sins. In your case, it's not a future promise. It's a past fulfillment. He has forgiven your sins. He will remember your iniquities no more. He will never hold them against you. That's his promise of the gospel. Please join me in the next Psalm 62, page 88 at the front of the hymn book if you want the music. Fortress. 
this I will never be shaken. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. century of the New Testament era, Jewish converts who came to believe in Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the promise of salvation, the Messiah, were being told that he was not sufficient in and of himself alone. They needed to continue the tradition of the ceremonial laws, the slaughter of animals, going to the temple, so on and so forth, if they wanted to truly be sure of their salvation. So they were starting to make them think their salvation depended on what they did as much as or in completion of what Christ had already done. John had to combat also this notion that the reason for this need of continuing in the ceremonies was that, well, Jesus Christ was a good guy, a great moral teacher, but he was not God, not God in the flesh. And that's why in the prologue to his gospel and throughout the rest of it, John presents Jesus Christ as true God from eternity. Watch out for the bold-faced statements there that make it clear. True God from eternity. Also, yes, true man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Like you and I in every way, yet without sin. So focus on the fact that the dual nature of Christ here as John presents it in the prologue to his gospel. True God from eternity. Also true man through whom... And again, a very important phrase to keep in mind, grace and truth, the unconditional love of the Father, and the truth that the Son has set us free is revealed in Jesus Christ. From John 1, 1 through 4, and then continuing 14 through 18, this word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist testifies concerning him. He cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of the word's grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. There's an Old Testament principle stated time and time again. That no one single individual 
can give his life in place of another. The cost is too great. One man for another man is insufficient. This is why it's so important to notice what John says here. He presents Jesus Christ as creator, as God, giving up his relationship with the Father in order to redeem the whole human race. The Father so loved that Son and his willingness to die for all of you and for me that he receives him back at heaven's throne at the right hand of God as our intercessor. That's true value. The creator dying for his creation. That can count for everyone. This is our gospel lesson for this morning. Please join me in the Alleluia sentence. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. These words are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. But have been inspired by God in the Old Testament through the prophet Jeremiah, or repeating in the book of Hebrews. As I said earlier, the Jewish converts were starting to stray from just grace through faith and not by works, back into the idea that their good works would avail them something before God, in addition to what Christ did. So here, in Hebrews 8, 6 through 13, the author reaffirms what they had heard so many times, repeated down through the centuries in the prophet Jeremiah's work. But now, not as something that was going to happen, not a day that was coming, but a day that has come in the person and the work of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So hear it again as he repeats it for the Jews of Jesus' day and age, after his ascension into heaven. And, and please note, this is the, the new covenant that makes the old one obsolete, no longer necessary. From Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. But the ministry Jesus received is as superior to that of the Old Testament priesthood as the covenant 
of which he is the mediator, is superior to the old one, and it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sin no more. By calling this covenant new, the Lord has made the first covenant obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. This is our lesson, the third lesson for today, our hymn. 286, the law commands and makes us know. Sunday after Sunday, that God's grace, His mercy, His peace are already yours. They come to each and every one of you as a gift from God our Father in heaven. They belong to you as an individual through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. The word of God for this morning's consideration from the Hebrews lesson for today. Hebrews 8, focusing on verse 6. But the ministry Jesus received is as superior to that of the Old Testament priesthood as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one and it is founded on better promises. This is God's word. Bow our heads. 
O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts now be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. You are our Redeemer. Amen. Dear friends of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I don't know what your experience was when, when you were confirmed, if you were confirmed as a youth. My experience was that we were prepped by the pastor for an examination. These days, I usually ask the students in my classes to write an essay, a testimony about their relationship to God based on a question raised in the essay. But back in the day, you better know your stuff by memory. And one of the key memorizations was the Ten Commandments. And you had better not only know the, the simple commandment itself, but also what does this mean as Martin Luther explained it in his small catechism. And then you would be set in front of the congregation and you would be asked questions. And you wouldn't be coached about which question you were going to be asked. You had a set of questions that might be asked, but the pastor could ask them of any student in the class, and then he would say, please stand up and answer the question, and you would stand up and you might be shaking in your boots and your voice might be quaking as you gave the answer, but you usually were prepped enough to give the answer. And so I'm figuring that after all this time, those of you who were confirmed as youth and those of you who may have been confirmed as adults are really familiar with the Ten Commandments. I would expect, as I have challenged before, that any one member of this congregation right now, if I called you by name, oh God, <laughs> would be able to stand up and recite verbatim the Ten Commandments. And, and I won't even ask you to give Luther's explanation. And I joke about it, and I'm kind of joking. Now, I wonder, you know, just, and I'm not going to ask you to really do it, because now probably everybody will raise their hand. <laughs> How many of you could recite Ten Commandments verbatim in order? So let's go to another aspect of confirmation, both youth and adult, OK? Um, back in the day, and also in this day and age, after you've gone through the examination or you've read your essay, you're usually asked to stand in front of the congregation facing the Lord's altar because you're about to make a promise to the Lord. And in that promise, there are usually two questions that revolve around the issue of your death. Will you suffer all? even death, rather than fall away from what you have been taught. And of course, because it's Confirmation Sunday, and you're in front of a host of good witnesses, as Timothy once was, Timothy the, the overseer of a, of a church in the first century, um, you're told how to answer. Yes, I will, with the help of God. So now the real question today is, have you kept your promise? Perfect. Could we go down the list of the Ten Commandments, and I'll recite them verbatim in order, and as I do, would you review them with me privately, in your own heart and mind, and be able to say, not once, not ever, have I gone astray? Not once, not ever, have I misused God's name. Not once, not ever, have I sat in the pew on a given Sunday, sad that I couldn't be watching the football game or the baseball game instead. Uh, have I always honored my father and my mother? Have I always treated them with the dignity and respect and esteem they deserve? as God's representatives on earth for me. Well, I've never murdered anybody. Have you? Have you ever wanted to? 
live a chaste and decent life in word and deed, not once ever lustful, ever pursuing in our hearts or just our minds, much less in reality, sexual immorality. Never stolen. I did. Tootsie Rolls. And you laugh. But I knew I was stealing Tootsie Rolls. Okay? And I knew it was something I should not do. But I did it anyway. Because I thought, there's a lot of Tootsie Rolls in the world. They're not going to miss these couple. Have you ever felt that way? about any sin you've ever committed? Oh, God can't really care about this when there's so much of that going on everywhere else. And so we make these great grand promises, and, and often each Sunday morning when we confess our sins and hear the absolution, there's an attitude of recommitment in our words and in the songs we sing following. Yes, as God gives me strength, I promise. And then the week comes on and challenges come our way. It gets hard, doesn't it, to live under law. I don't doubt that every one of us here today is a fairly good person. And that when you make a promise, you mean it. I promise. But then here's another question. Have you ever made a promise you didn't keep? Have you ever made a promise you really never intended to keep? Have you ever made a promise and somewhere along the way something else came up and you said, well, they're just going to have to understand that I can't keep my word today. It's hard living under the law. And your promises are good ones. When you make them, at the time you make them, I'm fairly certain each and every one of you, and I myself, were very sincere. We mean what we say. You have my word on it, we will tell people. You shake hands with individuals. You might even sign on the dotted line somewhere. And your intentions are good. What, what, what's that expression? The road to... Hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. So the promises are good. And in the light of the world and what's going on in the world today, this assembly might consider it a, a grouping of good people who often don't keep their word. Either to God or to other friends, family members, acquaintances, other human beings. So we have to face the fact that if we live under the law, if we expect that under the law, God needs to recognize us for who we are and what we have done and what we strive to continue to do, we are all going to hell when we die. Because the Bible says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends in just one point, he is guilty of it all. And in spite of the fact that if we decide to live under the law, We'll promise to be better the next day. If we decide to live under the law, the past doesn't go away. God remembers. God does not forget. And that's why the emphasis in this book of Hebrews, in that chapter 8, verse 6, is that the new covenant is founded on better promises. Not just our good intentions, but better promises, because those promises of the new covenant are not bilateral. It's not an, if you do this, then I will do that. If you fail to do this, I will hammer you into the ground. That's the law. That's what Moses found from Mount Sinai. If you, then I. The better promise is it's just all about I am, about Jehovah, about God about God, of whom Solomon once said, not a single one of anything he ever promised has ever fallen to the ground to be trampled underfoot. Every single promise God ever made, he has kept. 
He is true to his word. And that's why here in the book of Hebrews, the author says that this new covenant is founded on better promises. Because number one, God is the one making the promise. And number two, the promises of grace, of unconditional love, of undying, everlasting, unconditional God's love for sinners. Summarized in Paul's statement, while we were yet sinners, God's Son died for us. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring us closer to God. Because you see, that was always God's point. When he, he led Israel, I love that, that, that metaphor, by the hand out of Egypt. Come children, here, take my hand children, let's go, follow me. That was a great promise and, and he kept his word. But it's a better promise when we understand the purpose behind their preservation. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. This is God telling Satan, I will crush your head. You may strike at my heel. So there would be a loss somewhere along the way for someone. But not for you. Not for you. Oh, the Old Testament is so full of great, good gospel news that these people heard and heard over and over again in synagogue service after synagogue service. The Lord will lay on him the iniquity of us all. The punishment that brings us peace will be on him. By his wounds, we are healed. Promise after promise, metaphor after metaphor, underscoring the promise, and all about nothing we do, but everything God would do for each and every one of you. That's the gospel. That's why we give it the title also, Good News. Because it's based on a better promise. Not a bond bilateral between us and God, expecting our perfection, which, as all of these texts state, is just impossible. God will find fault with us. What does it say? You must be perfect because the Lord your God is perfect. But what God is doing by giving us those warnings is that we should not rely on ourselves. We should rely on him. We shouldn't think that we can attain perfection. We should understand that by the law comes the knowledge of sin. By the gospel comes the knowledge of grace and truth. And wonder of wonders, the God, our creator, giving up his life for his creation. So that you and I could be at peace with you and I could know where we're going when we die. You and I could rejoice. What did Paul say? Even in the midst of our sufferings, because suffering cannot destroy the hope of our relationship with God and our reconciliation with God and our peace with God through Jesus Christ. What did Paul write in another place? Nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus except you. See, that's, that's something you do know. But I'll bet you you don't know how it's attached to something you do know. You know I like to talk about memorization. And when you're in confirmation class, or when you're reading your Bible, you come across this great, wonderful gospel truth. And, and you don't have to say it out loud, but in your memory, even if you learned it in the KJV, in your mind, recite along with me. How does it say? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but has everlasting life. That's promise. I gave my son to you. But now remember, right after that, Jesus says something that you never memorized, probably. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It's a great good news still, right? Here's what I mentioned earlier. But those who reject the name of God's one and only son stand condemned already because they have rejected the name of God's one and only son. Not because they broke any one of the Ten Commandments along the way, but because they took that better promise of grace and truth and trashed it as meaningless for their lives. So, hang on to the better promise. In the face of any other promise you might have ever made and broken, any other word you ever gave that fell to the ground and was trampled underfoot, keep in mind that God will never trample you under his feet. God's only intent is to exalt you, to raise you up. And that's why he can say, and here's another great truth, I wouldn't expect you to remember the Ten Commandments verbatim and in order. But I would be willing to bet anything that any of you whose heart is in Jesus, who confesses the Lord as your Savior, who knows the great truth built on the better promise of forgiveness, I will never hold your sins against you, is a person who as you walk through your day, suddenly sees and seizes opportunities to pray or to do good unto all people as opportunity arises without even knowing that though you're not committing a thou shalt not, you are performing a thou shalt do. And that's how the Spirit of God works in you, not only to believe that you're saved, but to live out your salvation, giving glory to God. A better promise. Isn't it wonderful that everything that you depend upon, rely upon for your personal salvation, doesn't depend on you or I. It is dependent upon God, and he has fulfilled his promise, his better promise. Amen. Please rise. Now, may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ and to life everlasting. Amen. Please now, we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. This is what we all believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our offer.
may remain seated for the prayer of the church, but I want you to pray it out loud along with me, please. Following that, there'll be the special intercessions. I will ask you to stand for the Lord's Prayer and the words of the institution. But for now, join me in the prayer of the church. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, precious Savior, you suffered everything on the cross, both physical death and hell, to redeem the whole world, to redeem me, a lost and condemned creature. Graciously look upon me in this Lenten season. Assure me that I have been cleansed from all sin, that my soul has been redeemed by your holy sacrifice. Your wondrous love would not let me be damned without a fight. Thank you for fighting and winning for me. Each day compel me to pause and focus on your passion. Let nothing distract me from my thoughts about you and your sacrifice on my behalf. Each day draw me closer to you, that I may dwell on the forgiveness you provided for me and the peace with God I live in each day. Bless this Lenten season in every Christian congregation. Grant your pastor's grace to proclaim your glorious passion with conviction and power. May all who hear your words from the cross grow to love you more and more. Abide with every one of your disciples so that the Holy Spirit governs all of our thoughts, words, and deeds. Meditating on your death for our transgressions, grant us power every day to live for you, who lived and died and rose again for us, and who lives and rules through all eternity. Amen. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you are the God of life and death. You watch over all our comings and goings. Our times are in your hands. We raise up a special appeal in this morning hour for Bobby and Sherry Johnson's daughter-in-law's father. You know better than we do, Father in heaven, how many hours, days, minutes, seconds are left to him. You also know the state of his heart and mind, that at this point in time, he does not confess Jesus Christ as Savior. Therefore, we pray to you that somehow or other, by a movement of your own doing, you would send to his bedside a messenger of the grace of God in Christ, that he would hear the simple truth of the gospel. All sins are forgiven by the blood shed on the cross. We are declared not guilty by the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. May he hear this simple truth, and as did the thief on the cross, before his last hour comes, ask that you give him your, his room in paradise. We pray this knowing that miracles are possible in this world, especially when the word is brought to bear on a person's heart and mind. In the meantime, watch over his daughter as she sits by his bedside watching over him. May she also, however she has been touched by the Lord Jesus Christ's word of peace, come to peace in her own heart and mind and perhaps strengthened and renewed in her own faith. Share her thoughts with her father so that he can hear and also then be saved. We also thank you for the successful surgical procedure performed on our sister Joanne. We thank you that initially it seemed like it was very successful. However, it strikes her and Wayne that the infection may still be there, that the difficulty of breathing is still a part of her current lifestyle. We're asking, dear father, that just only be a, a side effect, just a brief passing moment in time that entire healing would be granted to her again by your power or by the review of the doctors attending to her care so that this affliction can be so completely removed from her system that she can breathe entirely on her own once again. We ask for all of these blessings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In his name, I ask you to rise and join me in the prayer of the cross. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took the cup saying, drink from it all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin. direction you come up this aisle one from this side to that side of the altar when you leave you leave down that aisle out that side door place your empty cup in that basket please be seated all is now in readiness the ushers may lead the community this morning. What is this bread?
be. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. It is the true blood of your Savior, shed for you. May the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in with and under this bread and wine, strengthen and preserve each and every one of you in the true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. You now depart. At peace with the Lord. Amen. is the true blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. It is the true blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. May the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in with and under this bread and wine, strengthen and preserve each and every one of you in the true and saving faith, and to life everlasting. Amen. Do not part at peace with the Lord. Amen.
is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. It is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. May the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve each and every one of you in the true and saving faith into life everlasting. Amen. You now depart at peace with the Lord. Amen. Please rise and thank the Lord together with me. which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Dear friends of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, children of the Heavenly Father, temples of the Holy Spirit, receive the blessing of your Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and always give to each and every one of you his peace. Amen. 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 One and six. One and six.
portions of this morning. Again, the Holy Spirit can work in your personal devotion as well as powerfully as he can to our assembly here to worship Jesus Christ. So take the worship folder home with you, or at least recall the chapters we read from, go home and read them again on your own. Now, the announcements for this week are on the back of the bulletin. You can please pay careful attention to those. I have a couple additions. I'll get my fingers through it. There we go. Uh, please note, especially the last midweek Lenten service this coming Wednesday, 5.30, the pre-service meal, 6.30 p.m. Pastor Bart Brower from Emmanuel Tempe will be preaching the message this coming Wednesday. The worship up and coming, please note, Thursday the 29th, Monday, Thursday, 6.30, there will be communion that evening. Good Friday, 6.30 p.m. Resurrection Sunday, 8 a.m. 8 Say it again with me. Count three. A A M. Okay, got that. Good. And then uh, this year you bring your own egg thing to pass, or maybe some donuts on the side. But it'll be a kind of a potluck Easter breakfast this year. Then note on Sunday, August eighth at eleven a.m. the first call meeting for this congregation. Pastor Buchholz will be present to lead that meeting. He'll present to you a list of candidates which you may discuss openly, and then the voters will choose unanimously first man they want to call to consider this church as his new calling to serve the Lord. So make sure you set that date and that time aside. You're all invited to attend that particular call meeting. Uh, saints in service to the Lord, uh, we're still painting. Uh, a couple people have uh, done a marvelous job on the parsonage and also on the annex. We still have the rough shed to do. And then correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, the whole exterior of the church? Okay, so there's a lot of work still to be done, but they're, they're going about it in a masterful fashion. You can notice that the progress on the shade structure is going on along quite well. We thank the Builders for Christ for their hard labors and hot sun, which I'm sure they're enjoying as opposed to cold moons and cold nights. So we're grateful for that. Um, I, I made a mistake, and I want to correct it before we move on, because I just thought of it now. We need to offer up a special prayer on behalf of two of those Builders for Christ. Uh, both men were injured while they were working here on our campus. Uh, one fell off at, uh, from a... Uh, what do you call those things again? Scaffolding. Scaffolding and, and ruptured his spine. And the other one uh, had a, a heavy piece of brick fall on his right foot and break his right toe. So, yeah, let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you are the God of life and death. You watch over all our comings and goings. Our times are in your hands. And we thank and praise you for the skill sets that have been brought to bear by the builders for Christ in constructing our shade structure for us. We thank and praise you for those men and those women who traveled so far to this foreign country to serve us so well with their own gifts of love and faith and fellowship, but especially the skill sets they bring to bear on this construction. We mourn the fact that two of those brothers have been injured in accidents. We pray this, dear Father in heaven, that recovery from the injuries they suffered would be quick, that they would be restored to full mobility sooner than anyone would have thought possible so that they can go about the routine of their life and their work and their worship unimpeded. In the meantime, keep them safe from any further physical harm and danger, both those already injured and those who continue to do good work for us here at Heritage. We ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, two things. First of all, we have before me here six free tickets to the game between the Milwaukee Brewers and the Los Angeles Dodgers. Oh, stop. The Cubs aren't going to anywhere this year. I've only been for eight years. We're waiting another set. You'll be in heaven. Okay. Um, these are free tickets. Uh, there are six of them available. If you want a set, you have to remember they come in pairs. There's two, two parts to each ticket. But there are six of them here. So if you're interested in going and seeing that game, I believe they play up in uh, uh, Scottsdale somewhere, right? No, Maryvale. They're in Maryvale? Yeah. Oh, well, that's forget. <laughs> <laughs> no, Maryvale's a nice place to go. It is. I, we, we served there a couple of years, uh, and we went for the boosters, and it's a great park, and they have a great venue. So if you want to go, if you want a ticket, First, well, maybe I shouldn't say first come, first serve. There'll be a rush for y'all. <laughs> See me. Anything else that I've missed this morning? Yes? There is going to be a movie at Great Bear Movie Theaters called The Riot and the Dance tomorrow night. And uh, it is produced by the same man. Stand up. Go ahead. 